Hey and welcome back. I thought I'd share with you today something I'm really passionate about. It's going to be blocked by YouTube, demonetized. There's going to be a copyright claim against me, but I think you need to see it. It's a film about the origin of our universe. <laughs> A small subject. No doubt we've all heard of the term Big Bang. And the Big Bang theory is that our universe was created, or started is a probably better term, at an event where all matter expanded faster than the speed of light and formed our universe. Probably about 13.8 billion years ago. But what very few people understand is how this whole concept of the expansion of our known universe came about. And that story has to be one of the best stories of mankind. A couple of years ago, while working for the BBC, I got to work on that very story with the wonderful producer, Susan Boyles. Wow. What an interesting film. So here today is a short extract about two scientists, hardly household names, Martin Ryle, Fred Hoyle. Now you might have heard of Fred. Fred did amazing work. Martin Ryle has sadly been lost in the mists of time. But it was Martin and Martin's instrument, which is one of the earliest radio telescopes on this planet that came up with the facts, the data, that galaxies were expanding. So the universe is expanding and anything that is expanding by extrapolation used to be smaller. It was controversial at the time because it implied a starting point. And the big argument of Fred Hoyle was if you had a starting point, you had a creator. Stephen Hawking has gone on to say that possibly we don't need a creator, the universe oscillates. Stephen Hawking's fantastic point is imagine an ice cream cone, you imagine it goes down to an infinitely sharp point, a singularity. But in fact, next time you have an ice cream, look at the very bottom of the cone. As it gets to the very nearly, 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 nearly pointy end, it isn't pointy, it's round. And although I'm very, very oversimplifying the wonderful Stephen Hawking science, the bottom of an ice cream cone, the round bit, the tiny round bit, is actually the physics behind our current understanding of how universes don't need to be created, but as they get smaller down to a point, to a unity point, time and matter and the physics bend, so they actually never need to actually be created, they just expand and contract. Personally, I think. He's got it. Let's look at the original argument. This was the Big Bang versus the steady state. As I said, it's going to be demonetized. I'm just totally rubbish on YouTube. Thank you for being loyal viewers. Watch it. It'll earn no income whatsoever, but you need to see it because it's fantastic. And the truth is out there. While Dirac was developing the foundations of quantum mechanics, explaining the world of the very small, other scientists were working at the opposite scale, exploring the boundaries of the known universe. General relativity had led to the idea that we live in an expanding universe, and observations had confirmed it. But this led to a fundamental question. Did the universe have a beginning? It was a question that would cause one of the bitterest rivalries in science. 
a conflict that consumed two brilliant physicists, but would ultimately lead us to a deeper understanding of the universe. As you probably know, there are two forms of, of cosmology, what has been spoken of as the Big Bang and the steady state. The one I've been associated with, the galaxies must be forming the whole time. Fred Hoyle was the son of a wool merchant and brusque Yorkshireman who believed that the universe had no beginning and has no end. In the explosion uh, theory, we, we suppose that the matter in the universe was originally in a highly condensed state, which then expanded. And <clears throat> the galaxies which we now see are fragments of this explosion. Martin Ryle was a volatile yet sensitive man who, unlike Hoyle, believed the universe did have a beginning. Both worked at Cambridge University, and in the 1950s, neither man had enough evidence to prove one way or the other who was right. I only got to know Fred Hoyle after 1965 when I was a student, but I already became aware that he had been a great figure in the history of the subject. Indeed, between 1945 and 1965, I think it's fair to say that he contributed more to astronomy on the theoretical side than anyone else in the world. He was an extraordinarily inventive and versatile person. And his greatest achievement in retrospect was to realize that all the atoms that we are made of were forged inside stars. Hoyle was a confident man, whose great achievements were in part because he wasn't afraid to go it alone. One of the things that one has to, uh, to think about is you have to have a sense of obstinacy in science, because if you don't, you're not going to go against the crowd. And if you don't go against the crowd, you're not going to have any real successes. Um, but the question then is, uh, is can it um, interfere with one's judgment? Well, um, let me make it absolutely clear that a sense of obstinacy is only of value insofar as it allows you to discount the opinions of other humans. At the time, Hoyle was an atheist, and so perhaps it wasn't surprising that his steady-state theory avoided any hint of a genesis. He said, that the universe had always looked the same, that new galaxies formed in the spaces made by the universe's expansion. And as a practice popularizer of science, Hoyle took to the airwaves to promote his point of view. The BBC presents the nature of the universe. The speaker is Fred Hoyle, a Cambridge mathematician and fellow of St. John's College. Perhaps like me, you grew up with the notion that the whole of the matter in the universe was created in one big bang at a particular time in the remote past. What I'm now going to tell you is that this is wrong. Hoyle was the first person to refer to the explosion theory as a big bang. And although he didn't intend it to, the phrase captured the public's imagination and became a brilliant marketing tool for his opponents. Perhaps his greatest opponent was Ryle, different in almost every way. Unlike Hoyle, he was a practical scientist, an engineer, who sought to observe the secrets of the universe. Mapping the faintest, furthest things in the universe with a radio telescope, the newest and most exciting instrument in astronomy. This is Martin Ryle, Fellow of the Royal Society, Professor of Radio Astronomy at Cambridge University. We're receiving naturally emitted radiation, just like the light from a star. And if we listen to these radio waves, as in the case of the distant source in Cygnus, what we hear is a rushing noise. Martin Ryle was, above all, a brilliant 
technician and engineer, but also he combined that with being someone who uh, understood the theory of what he was doing um, and the importance of it. And I think it's important to realize that having invested many years of effort in developing a pioneering new telescope and actually built it and made the effort to get the money for it, etc., uh, then clearly uh, he had a huge stake in ensuring that he did important work and was naturally therefore rather sensitive uh, at criticism of the output. So when theorist Fred Hoyle publicly questioned the accuracy of the first data set produced by his telescope, Ryle was devastated. I think he took criticism rather deeply. This, part, this partly because of his personality. Unlike Fred Hoyle, he was not robust in argument. He got genuinely upset and he didn't really like taking part in debate. He didn't go to many conferences. He didn't enjoy them. And so uh, he therefore took very deeply any criticism. It meant a lot to him. In front of the media, Ryle was very self-controlled and diplomatic. But those who knew him well often saw a different side to him. Martin Ryle did have a bit of a temper. There's no doubt about it. He would very easily fly into a rage about something. And I ended up by getting on extremely well with him by writing down what my argument was and giving it to him. I would then get that back after a day or two with viral markings, which are often so fierce as to go right through the paper. Uh, and that would be his view of the whole thing, and I would reply. And so we had this correspondence, and it's my great regret that I've kept none of that. But many of those bits of paper were pretty transparent after he had a go at them. Ryle's fury with Hoyle fueled his determination to use his radio telescope to destroy the steady-state theory. Now, can you explain exactly what you've been doing? Well, I think we'd better have a diagram here, and perhaps we could look at the board. According to the theory of continuous creation, the density of galaxies would be the same in the neighborhood of the Earth here, right out to the edges of the observable universe. And one way in which one could test the two theories is to make a measurement of the variation of the density of galaxies with distance from us. If the steady state theory was right, then the more distant galaxies, which are older, would be distributed just as they are now, because it says the universe has always been the same. If the Big Bang theory was right, then the more distant galaxies would be more densely packed, because the early universe would have been crammed full of matter before expanding and evolving. It's very easy for someone in the public to look at this and think, well, it's two astronomers arguing about something. They're not. I mean, they're very different. Mathematician and an engineer are really rather different animals. They do look at the universe in a completely different way. They see different things. That was the fundamental problem, I think. There was very little attempt on either side, I believe, to understand the other, how, that, how they worked, how they ticked. Unlike Ryle, Hoyle was a performer and wasn't one to keep his opinions to himself. You reject this Big Bang theory, this concept of a beginning and an evolution and it going on. Well, I do, and I, and I always have done. One doesn't impress on the universe its properties in, in, in the start. I think my objection to Ryle was that he was too short too quickly. Martin Ryle also found it very difficult with Fred Hoyle being extremely negative about the work of the group. But it's also true that Martin Ryle really made no serious attempt to build bridges with Hoyle and his people. And I think that that was very unfortunate. The two groups were working maybe as far as 200 yards apart in the same town, an easy walk from one to the other, and the contact between the two groups was minimal. Collecting radio telescope data was a slow process. But in 1961, Martin Ryle presented a comprehensive catalogue. Finally, he could settle the matter. The first and most remarkable result of all, as we proceed outwards from the most intense and presumably nearest sources, we find a great excess of fainter ones. The universe must have changed radically within the time span accessible to our radio telescopes. This result seems to show quite clearly that the steady state, the continued creation uh, theory of the universe cannot be correct. The results imply that the universe is changing with time. 
The rivalry between these two men had finally yielded a result, evidence for the Big Bang Theory. Most of it comes from a volume much larger. For most astronomers, the proof was now stacked against Hoyle and his theory, although Hoyle himself wouldn't accept it. You have here in Cambridge Professor Ryle, who is a radio astronomer, and as I understand it, he made a study of the radio stars and claims to have proved your steady state theory to be wrong. I still take the same view today. I think we cannot know whether there is a contradiction with the theory until we know exactly what these radio sources are. Even when the rest of the scientific community embraced the Big Bang Theory, Hoyle refused to join them. In the early 1970s, Hoyle felt forced out of Cambridge. He moved to the Cumbrian countryside, where he pursued his love for science fiction writing. She's ready. Here, he also had more time to spend with friends, including a man who was revolutionizing the other great branch of 20th century physics, the quantum world of subatomic particles. Despite their very different specialisms, they found they had a lot in common. Have you had a moment when, in a complicated problem, where quite suddenly the thing comes into your head and you're almost sure you've got to be right? Oh, yes. That's I mean, this is what a great... A, really, oh, really, really, God. Really, really, uh, yeah. Richard Feynman was the ultimate showman, an American who became everybody's favorite physicist. That old black magic that you weave so He was a brilliant mathematician. I got those fingers enamored by the smallest, most fundamental building blocks of the universe. Suppose that little things behaved very differently than anything that was big. The behavior of things on a small scale is so fantastic. It's so wonderfully different. Thank <laughs> you.